before we start, uh, what I usually do, uh, because the Bible says that, or Jesus actually said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach us all, all things. And then kind of John picks up on that. And he says that the anointing in us, he teaches us. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does best is teach, take the words or things that Jesus said, and he imparts it into our hearts. So um, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit and we're going to ask him to teach us. So he can, he can use me so I can learn too. I want to learn too. So he can give me the things to say. Okay? All right, so I'll say, Father God, I just ask that you would send your Holy Spirit tonight, Lord. That you would teach me all the things that you just said, the things that you just did. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge you in this place. We love you. We, we just, I'm just asking to learn from you. You are the teacher. We are the students. Holy Spirit, just teach me, God. Give me the words to say. Give me the oracles of God. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your ministry. I thank you for being in this place. In the name of Jesus, anoint our ears to hear what you are saying to the church today. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in the book of Mark. And we're going to jump right in. Now, the gospel of Mark, it, you know, there's four gospels. And to understand, um, like, like, why is there four gospels, right? And each gospel has a little bit of Differences. I mean, there are a lot of the things or a lot of the events kind of seem the same. Like if you compare you know, Matthew, Luke, and Mark. And then you have John, which is completely different. It has only a few those miracles, right? And a lot of teaching around that. Well, the reason uh, we have four Gospels is Holy Spirit wanted to give us the four portraits of Jesus Christ. The four that so. Every gospel, the Holy Spirit wants to highlight certain things. So, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, he's highlighting Jesus as the son of David. Uh, very important to understand. Though. It sets the whole context of him as not only being a son of man, but actually the son of David, David, the root of Jesse. Very important. And I have Luke, where the Holy Spirit highlights him as a son of man. Very important. And then you have Mark where you know, the Holy Spirit highlights the ministry of Jesus. You know, as he is the servant of all. That's the kind of theme you kind of feel that Holy Spirit is saying, you know, what Jesus did. And you see, it goes from miracle to miracle. And it's like he went from this place to that place. And it kind of talks about uh, or highlights Jesus as, uh, as a servant. And then the Gospel of John, it's, it's an, a gospel about Jesus as being son of God, his, his beauty, his uh, preeminence, uh, his glory, his relationship with the Father. That's where he really, the Holy Spirit, unpacks the heart of our Father. And when you read the Gospel of John, you can just feel his, when Jesus is just talking about his Father and, and all those things. So each gospel is very unique in its way. And and it's a glorious representation of the Son of God. And so we are focusing on the, on the Gospel of Mark. And so we're going to start right away. And uh, we go to verse 1. Now Mark kind of skips the, the, you know, the birth of Jesus and the Christmas story, if you want to say. And he goes right into work. I think that's how intense this one's going to be. So he says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, verse 2, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So Mark, right away, he goes into the gospel of Jesus. He says, he is the Son of God, and he gives the prophetic word that was spoken through Malachi. Now this particular uh, passage, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, is God speaking to Jesus in Malachi 1, and then a couple verses down. And Malachi, uh, Malachi um, 3.1, I'm sorry, Malachi 3.1, he talks about, it's a prophetic word about Jesus' two comings. If you read it on your own time, you'll see that it's his first coming, where he suddenly comes into the house of God, or the house of prayer, which is a temple, and you can read right away, it connects his second coming. Once 
he's going to come and fire again to the temple. This time to the house of prayer. And so Malachi in the prophecy is prophesying about two comings of Jesus. So, so uh, Mark is quoting basically that prophecy that, that the prophets prophesied that the Messiah is going to come. And he says this is where it's written. So that's why he starts out. But then he adds another prophetic voice, the prophet Isaiah. And he says right here, the voice of one cry, uh, of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now that's out of Isaiah 40. I read Isaiah 40. He talks about, it's a prophetic word about, uh, about John the Baptist. Uh, that the spirit of Elijah, again, if you go back to Malachi, it talks about, that God says, I will send to you Elijah the prophet. Because we know that you know, John the Baptist, he, uh, if you read Luke, he, he, the angel um, Gabriel, he said that uh, John the Baptist is going to function in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to reunite the hearts of the fathers to the children, right? And the hearts of the children to the fathers. Well, John the Baptist, when he broke onto the scene, he operated in the anointing of the Elijah the prophet. And what he was doing, he was baptizing people in repentance. Now, the whole idea of baptism in water for submersion was a new idea. So he comes out of the wilderness, you know, and he starts uh, calling people to repent because Messiah is coming. He is making the path straight. Interestingly enough, those people that believed the message that John was preaching and were baptized in the river, those people received Jesus. Now the Pharisees, they rejected uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. And the Bible is clear that they had rejected him and they lost their place. And you know, the will of God was for them to embrace Jesus. But because they rejected John and the spirit of Elijah, operating in the spirit of Elijah, they basically cut themselves out. That's very important. So people that were repenting, were getting baptized, a lot of uh, Jesus' um, disciples came out of, you know, that uh, from John. They actually came over from John. So that's kind of an interesting point. And I think the Gospel of John kind of talks more about that, um, John's ministry. But again, it's uh, Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now remember, he connects Malachi with two comings. Well, uh, Isaiah 40 is in the context of two comings because God is going to raise up, raise up the voice in the church that will cry out, will prepare the way for Jesus' second coming. Mm -hmm. In fact, God is going to anoint people within the church. The Holy Spirit is going to anoint people to proclaim or make the way for Jesus' second coming. They will preach repentance and the kingdom of God in power. So, it has, those two prophecies have both implications. His first coming, and then his second coming. If you kind of study it out on your own time, you can see that. And we're, or, you know, we're close to that time, in that one generation when God's going to transform the earth for the age to come, in that one generation, he's going to just anoint men and women in the spirit of Elijah. They will be the voice crying out in the wilderness. That will call it, they will say, Jesus is coming, as bridegroom, king, and judge, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And there's going to be power, anointing, prophetic anointing moving, and a lot of the hearts will be churned. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming for a victorious church. That's right. And God will prepare it through the Holy Spirit, through that anointing of Elijah the prophet of Malachi. Again, if you, if you read it, it's, it's at the very end. I think it's Malachi 4 5. It says, Elijah is coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Again, it's the spirit of Elijah will be put out from the church. Not just one person like John the Baptist was just one guy. This is going to be many men, many women that God's going to choose to anoint in that specific way. Okay? So we go to verse 4. Well, it says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, he was preaching uh, repentance. Now, this is one message is the least amount you will hear. There's two messages you don't hear much. It is about God, who He is. Now we talk about 
you know, how to conduct ourselves, how to live, but you don't see a lot of messages about God, his personality, his emotions, mm -hmm. who he is, his beauty, his glory, all of those things, and you don't find a lot on repentance. Now, there's reasons why you don't hear that much, but I really believe those people that will be anointed, just like John the Baptist, by the Holy Spirit, they will be bold in saying things that Jesus said and do things that Jesus did. And not be afraid for persecution that is going to come their way, for sure. John the Baptist, he lost his head. Because, why? Because he was saying to Herod, this is what you're doing is wrong. Because we know that you know Herod, he uh, took his brother's wife and said, can't do that. And he was bold about it, and it cost him his life. Anyway, that's a little bit further down, but just to kind of give you the thing, uh, the pers perspective. So he was baptizing in water, repentance of or remission of sin. So he's preparing people for Jesus. Now, what is he preaching? So uh, actually, we're going to go to verse, verse 5. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Again, there's a correlation. When their repentance is preached, people went and they confessed their sins. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't teach that. They say, well, just kind of repeat the sinner's prayer, which is great. We do that. It's kind of where we start, right? Uh, repentance unto salvation is basically you are repenting to God for serving darkness. Mm -hmm. So I serve darkness, and now Jesus, forgive me for that, for doing the will of the devil in my life. I want to do your will now. I repent. Forgive me, and that's how we get saved. We see Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Well, then there's an element, another element of confession of sins. Well, we repent to be saved, but there's some things in our lives where we specifically have to say, if I was stealing, say, Lord, forgive me, I was a thief. I repent of it. If somebody was a murderer, he would say, Lord, forgive me, I was a murderer. And you say those things, exactly what you've done. And then the grace would come in and would just set us free from those things. So confession is very important. Now we, again, re general repentance is when we turn from doing the will, our own will, and you know, the will of the devil, and then doing the will of God. That's a general repentance. And then we repent in our lives as we walk with God, and He highlights areas in our life, like hey, you know, you, you're gossip or you're doing something, and you say, I confess those things. God, I am a gossiper. Holy Spirit, I'm so I just repent of it, and that's how we get sanctified. Okay, mm -hmm. it's confession of our sins as we, as the Holy Spirit leads us and highlights things to us. All right, so that's very important. So verse six. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now John looked a little bit different um, mm -hmm. from other people. Uh, you know. He came out of the wilderness, so he lived in the area of the in the part of the Judea where there were kind of hills and there was a Dead Sea. There was a group of people that were called Essenes, if I can pronounce it correctly. It's that was a community of people. What they did, so they would live separate from everybody, and they uh, would their main task was they would live in the community and they would rewrite the the copy Torah. So they would they would make more copies, and they have to be done by hand. So they had this ritualistic practice of washing themselves. They would, before they would write the Bible, they would, they would have these things of water. They would you know, wash themselves, purify themselves through water, and they would keep you know, copying the Bible. So, and they lived a th uh, life of fasted lifestyle. That was their thing. They were very, you know, prayer, fasting, and reading the Bible, basically. So he kind of grew up in that, but he came out of that wilderness, out of that, out of that. Maybe he lived there. Nobody really knows. Um, but he came out of that, the life of prayer and fasting. So, so if you are a forerunner, if God's calling you to be a forerunner, uh, anointed by the Spirit of Elijah, you will be uh, reading. Your lifestyle is going to be prayer and fasting. I mean, it's a, and the Bible, basically those three main elements that will that will uh, you know carry carry through your life. So he ate very simple diet. Again, it talks about simplicity, simple living. Uh, if, you know, if you think about uh, ministries, you know, anointing the Holy Spirit, we think like, well, there's, when that happens, you know, 
people very fast are becoming that they're because you know ministry is going, power is released, and 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 money is coming in, and very easy for a, for somebody that's operating in the in the prophetic and you know the things that God gives that to start living off the things that people give. So so their their life is not so simple anymore, right? They start getting you know bigger houses, bigger cars. There's nothing wrong with that. But I really believe, and I'm kind of locked in, that I, I really believe to, to be um, a forerunner, um, you know, like in that, it's like, like John the Baptist, you really have to be okay with a simple lifestyle, right? I think that's important because um, as God gives more anointing for different things, um, it is important that we, that we are simple, that we are uh, very flexible, that, you know, God says go here, we go here. We're not tied down to a lot of the things. Um, and I really believe that's kind of a picture of a forerunner here as we look at John the Baptist. Now, again, nothing wrong with having possessions. I'm just saying about those people that dedicate their life in a very specific way, um, like John the Baptist did. All right, so verse 7. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. So now again, he's baptizing them in repentance. And what is he preaching? Well, he's preaching about Jesus. Yeah. Right? He's saying, Yes, I come before him to prepare your heart, but I am really just a servant. Jesus is coming, and he's so glorious, so mighty, so powerful, so cut above, so separate, or set apart, or holy, if you want to use that word holy, set apart, that I'm not even worthy to tie his shoe, shoelace. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. His glory, his supremacy in everything. So if we really want to be, you know, the forerunners or people that God anoints in that specific, specific way, we have to have the revelation of Jesus Christ. You must see him exalted, beautiful, glorious, because that's the only thing that's really going to motivate you when trouble comes, when persecution comes, when they put you in jail, when, when people will say things about you. That one thing will keep you steady. The revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's your number one assignment, to know who He is. So, Holy Spirit says, okay, I will show you, but you have to ask me. Talk to me, and I will reveal to you. So, as we walk with the Lord, we, we say, Holy Spirit, reveal to us the beauty of Jesus in my life. And just, we just say those words. And when we do that, He does it to our life. So, um, that's what he did, and he said that Jesus is cut above. And he says right here, verse 8, I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Only God can give his spirit. Okay. And so he's saying that Jesus is the one that's coming after me, because he knew his ministry was going to be pretty short, short, short amount of time. But he says, this man, is cut above. There's no one like him. He has authority to give the Holy Spirit. Well, only God can give the Holy Spirit. And, and he's acknowledging, again, it's a big step back then to acknowledge Jesus as God. In fact, Jesus was crucified. He was arrested and crucified on the charge of blasphemy because he, they said, you being a man calling yourself God, that's blasphemy. Well, John says, well, he is so superior, he is God, and he is the one that gives the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. Well, we want the Holy Spirit. Well, you have to have Jesus in your life. Um, uh, people seek a lot of the things of the Spirit without having the revelation of Jesus Christ. I will contend, if you go deep in God and you ask him, uh, Jesus to reveal himself to you. I mean, he gives the Holy Spirit without measure. Amen. 
He's the one. He's the bad guy okay. in the Holy Spirit. So it's like, it's kind of interesting. So we go deep into it. That's amazing. So let's go. Um, so he says right here, verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, keep in mind that Jesus uh, lived in Galilee. Now, Nazareth was a little town in Galilee. Um, Galilee was um, north of Jerusalem. So, if you can, so you had you had Jerusalem or Judea, where Jerusalem was. Then you had if you go a little north, you have Samaria, and then you go a little bit more north, you have Galilee, where uh, there were cities like Cana. Uh, there were a few cities around the, the. It was a big sea where they would you know fish, and it was a, there were fishmongers. I don't know if word to use, but they would catch fish, and all those things would happen. So Jesus grew up in a small town in Nazareth, and it's another you know, topic uh, that he came out of just a small little town. Um, it's like obscurity, and uh, for 30 years, uh, just being a construction worker, knowing fully who he is, people were underestimating him. I mean, can you imagine you're coming in, you know, to Jesus, and he's, you know, he's making your table, and and, and the client's not happy about some things, and it's like, if you only knew who you're talking to, because Genesis 1, God is building your table. I mean, That's right. <laughs> but, but, but people couldn't even, even grasp that. Now, John did. But average people that grew up with him could not even grasp who was walking and living in that little town. So you're thinking, well, my life is kind of small. I live in a little town. I mean, I, my, you know, my surroundings, all of that is just really small. I mean, you know, what, what ministry, how does that going to all work out? Don't worry about that. Jesus came from a small town. Mm -hmm. He knows your address. <laughs> he knows where you live. So when your time comes and the sending out happens, he will find you. Even if it's a little town you, you go to, like, and you say, God, what can I do here? Trust me, he has your number. He knows where you live. Yeah. It does not stop you. The little place, the little, you know, you have only like 10, 20 people that you, that you, it's your sphere of influence. That's good. Yes. If time comes, God will find you. Yeah. And he will, you know, give you the ministry that he has appointed for. Because everybody has, has a ministry that, or a destiny from God that we have to fulfill and yeah. walk in. All right, so he comes from, and he gets baptized in the Jordan. Now the question is, like, why was Jesus baptized in Jordan? Because he has not sinned, right? Because John was um, uh, baptizing in repentance. So people will come in water. I'm imagining they will say, John, you know, I was a thief, or whatever the case may be, and he says, okay, and he would, you know, submerge in the water, and he would come out, and he says, we'll be forgiven. So, well, Jesus didn't sin, so he comes in, and John, and other gospels, it's like, John, it's like, Jesus, I can't baptize, I need to be baptized from you, but like, how does this work? This, something's like, doesn't compute in my head, and just says, John, John, I need to do this. Yeah. Well, he needed to do this because he had to Prophetically, yes. it was a prophetic Hallelujah. statement That's right. that he was going to die and rise again. Mm -hmm. That he was going to die, not for his sins, mm -hmm. but for the sins of many. Mm -hmm. And he was going to be resurrected mm -hmm. for, so we are become alive in him because of the resurrection of Jesus. So John did not understand fully, but then Jesus says, you, I have to get back to John. We have to do this. So John baptized him, and it was a prophetic, prophetic moment where okay. Jesus was baptized unto death, and as a you know, prophecy as his resurrection, which would happen, you know, three and a half years later, or whenever the time of the cross came. So, verse 10, and immediately, so right after he got out, coming up from the water, so John sees this. He saw the heavens parting. Now, it's, of course, he's seeing in the spirit realm. And the spirit descending upon him like a dog. So John has this supernatural vision. Mm -hmm. He sees that the you know the sky open up. There's this, this dimension opens up, and he sees Holy Spirit descending on Jesus as a dog. Because Jesus, in his first coming, he's bringing peace and goodwill. Mm -hmm. And all the angels were prophesying uh, that he's coming. Baby's born. It's good news. Mm -hmm. Now, his second coming, 
is good news to those who believe. That's right. It's terrifying news to those who reject. In the first coming, you know, in a major, like, small town, there's just... Uh, second coming, he's coming with power. That's right. On a horse, with armies of heavens, with glory clouds, not like clouds, glory clouds, supernatural clouds. That's right. Every eye will see him. Mm -hmm. Even blind people's eyes will pop open. <laughs> Every eye will see him. His glory. And he's coming with power. And he's coming as a Jewish man. It's not like Jesus comes like 40 feet tall, like everybody sees him. They see him <laughs> as a man, whatever, five, six, whatever, how high he was yeah. in, his, in his resurrected body. They're going to see him. So he's low enough where they can see that it's a Jewish man riding on a horse. I mean, <laughs> Can you imagine? And uh, of course, the church is getting raptured at, at that moment. And the unbelievers, they're terrified. Um, and the Antichrist and his armies are gathering in the battle of Jehoshaphat. They're getting for they're gearing up for war against the man riding on the on a white horse, victorious, glorious, the king of glory. That's right. And he's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming to deliver Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. So his first coming, you know, the Holy Spirit, it's the anointing, peace, the goodwill that he's going to, prophetically, that he's going to bring peace to the human heart, to the human race, for those who believe. Yes. Very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, verse 11, then the voice came from heaven. So the Father speaks. I mean, I, I can't even I can't. fathom that. The booming <laughs> voice. You are my beloved Son, beloved. in whom I am well pleased. Now remember, Jesus did not do one miracle. Right? He lived 30 years as an average person. Sure. Monday, Monday work, Tuesday work, coffee, work, lunch, <laughs> dinner, <Coffee. friends. laughs> you know, go to synagogue, uh, Sunday school. After 30 years, mm -hmm. just being, just going through life as an average person, okay? God says, I am pleased with you. Like, God, the Father, I didn't do anything yet, not one miracle. I didn't, no. That's exactly it, in the mundane. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was fellowshipping with Father in the mundane, every day. Yeah. Going to work, you know, doing things around the house, you know, helping mom, having brothers, maybe helping with, you know, whatever, um, neighbors. In the mundane, Father said, I saw every single thing you've done, mm -hmm. son, and I'm well pleased. Well, when he looks at us, we think of God like, I, I, I don't really do anything. Like, it's important, right? I just, you know, I get up. I mean, but God says, I see everything. The little movements of your heart. Yeah. We say, God, I'm just so thankful that I'm, I'm alive. God says, I see that. I love that. Thank you for acknowledging my presence. And then, you know, when somebody offends you, I mean, like, you choose to forgive. God. It hurts, mm. but I love you, God, and I, I just choose to forgive. And God says, I see that. I am pleased with you. So it's in the little thing mm -hmm. that God is pleased with us. So Jesus didn't do anything yet. <laughs> Father says, I love you. I am well pleased with you. Mm -hmm. like, God, how would that be? Don't you need me to do something for you? Like mm -hmm. thousands coming to you, like all these filling all the stadiums. He said, no, 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 wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the mundane, yeah. everyday life. I am pleased with you. I love you. Just, and he just confirms it. I can imagine John was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and probably people that heard it. Well, that's an amazing encounter. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. He's baptized in the Holy Spirit. Again, he's walking every step. He's setting precedent for us to follow. Remember, that's called the baptism, right? We all get water back here. After, if you're a believer and you haven't gotten wa wa uh, water baptism, you need to get one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Jesus commands us to do it. And then same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So immediately, so he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. It's like, no, God. <laughs> drive me into your presence. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's not our first thought. Oh. In the flesh, we don't want it. We don't want wilderness. Nobody wants wilderness. Nobody wants spiritual drought in our life. Because in wilderness, our hearts get tested. And we don't like that. We want 
to be by the living waters. You know, God touches us, we repent, we feel God's presence, that God is so amazing, I can do anything with you, and then the Holy Spirit says, it's great, I love you, but let's go with me. I'm going to take you somewhere. Like, where are we going, Holy Spirit? To the wilderness. <laughs> In the wilderness, so we get there, and it's dry, bread is boring, the Bible is boring, everything's hard, everything's hard, problems, people don't like me, people don't understand me. And that's where our transformation of our hearts takes place. Amen. In the wilderness. Amen. That's where we get formed. Okay? So if you're in a spiritual drought in the wilderness, thank the Holy Spirit for taking you there. The Holy Spirit, you took me there. Thank you. Just work on me. And what, how does he work on you? He uses people. He uses people to say some things to you, uh, to do some things to you, to... to Kind of show the blind spots yeah. in our heart that we don't even see. Yeah. Yeah. We get angry, we get this and all that, and then we pray. It's like, how, how, like, Lord, why do, why do I feel these negative emotions? Well, He will say, well, there's a little bit of pride, there's a little bit of different things yeah. going on, yeah. I, but, but I want to help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the wilderness is very important. Yes, temptation comes, but we must overcome. We must be overcomers. Yes, right. And in the wilderness, that's where we get shaped. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, Song of Songs, if you, if you read that, the dynamic where the beloved kind of runs off, and then the searching begins for his presence. <laughs> well, that's kind of us. It's dry, God. I want your presence. I don't know where to go. I'm going to go to every prayer meeting, you know, like you're trying to. <laughs> I want that. Great. Amazing. Just run after me. Run after me. Have that heart. So. So the wilderness, let's keep going. Um, verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, again, temptation, dynamic, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Hmm. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. Interesting, wild beasts, like wild, no, wild animals, no, no, wild beasts. Keep in mind, when we go into the wilderness, there's going to be God kind of even allows some demonic uh, resistance in our lives mm. that we learn how to overcome it and how to defeat it. Mm. Right. Okay? That's right. There is angelic interventions. Hallelujah. Now, we don't see those things in our natural eyes unless God opens our eyes, our mm. eyes, we see you know, what's going on. It makes sense. But since we don't see a lot of things, don't make sense. Like, why is this happening to me? Well, there's wild beasts. And we have to contend with them. We have to overcome them and take authority over them. Mm -hmm. That's where we learn warfare. Now, Paul writes, mm -hmm. I believe in Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken, he writes and he says about, I think it's 2 Corinthians, he had such a hard time in Asia. And he didn't even think he was going to live under I mean, that pressure, that demonic pressure. That he, said, he said, I fought the beasts of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is before the revival broke out in, in Acts 19. He couldn't even preach the word. He tried to go to Ephesus, but the Spirit said, don't go here. And so they made the circuit and went to Macedonia through, through Troy. And he says, and he kind of, in the letters, if you, kind of, if you piece them together, he says, it was so hard, spiritually speaking. In the Spirit, he had to pray things through. He said, I fought beasts at Ephesus. Well, when he gained the victory in the Spirit, Hallelujah. chapter 19, Acts 19, he comes in. There's a few disciples, and he asked them if they received the Holy Spirit. And they said, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. They said, well, in what name were you baptized? Oh, well, John baptism. Oh, we're going to baptize in the name of Jesus, and you'll receive the Holy yeah. Spirit. So he gets them baptized, and the Holy Spirit falls. And they start prophesying and praying in tongues. Now, revival breaks out in Ephesus. Remember, Paul is fighting in the Spirit. He's depressed. It's hard. But he pushes through the apostolic prayers. I mean, mm -hmm. read his apostolic prayers in, in, in the book of um, Ephesians. He breaks through and then revival breaks out. Mm -hmm. Things happen in our life when we're in that mm -hmm. season where we have to pray and press in. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know why it's so hard, but this is how we gain ground. When, when we get that breakthrough, a loved one gets saved. Things happen for the things we're contending for. But it's not easy. You have to fight for it. And Jesus said, those who overcome, I will give. Okay? The overcomers. 
And we are overcomers, I believe it. All right, so he was tempted, and there was angelic ministry. So it's both ends. So there's angels, there's demons, things that are kind of involved, but we stay steady. We stay steady. Steadfast. Verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now John, we know, was put in prison. And the, one of the reasons why he was put in prison is because of Herod. Because he was vocal about the things that were happening in the political arena. And of course, his uh, Herodotia, I don't know how you pronounce her, the name, she was angry that, that John was calling out sexual immorality. And she got so angry that she, you know, I don't know how that happened, but, but they, they arrest John, and they put him in prison, and now he's in prison. Well, when they put John in prison, uh, Jesus started to preach and baptize. And he started preaching the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, I like to call it, is a, is a beautiful diamond with many facets. People like think, okay, kingdom of God is power evangelism. And they would be right. Some say, well, no, kingdom of God is about healing image. And they would be right. Mm -hmm. You know, so say, kingdom of God is about being a missionary. And they would be also <laughs> right. Yeah. It's one diamond. Mm -hmm. Many facets. And those facets are highlighted in our lives in certain seasons. And some people are called to be a missionary. But they're different facets, too. So that so if you think of kingdom of God, it's the full diamond with many sides of it. So some ministers emphasize one side because the grace is given to them to be a church that is really excelling in worship, let's say. Well, that's a facet. So you can't say, well, that's kingdom of God. It is, but it's more than that. Yeah. It's just a facet. So uh, let's say your, your intercessor said, no. Prayer is, is where it is. That's the <laughs> kingdom of God. Yes, you're right. But it's just a facet of the same diamond. We all work together. Many different giftings. Yeah. Many different assignments. Mm -hmm. Many different ministries. One diamond. One kingdom. That's, we're working for one kingdom. So I'm teaching now. We're working for one kingdom. Some of you are doing different things. And we'll be doing different things. One kingdom. Mm -hmm. Just a different facet. Whatever assignment God gives us. But we embrace other ministries. We embrace right. what they do. So we work together. We don't, uh, we don't, just because they don't pray enough, we don't say, well, you know, they, they don't get it. We don't, that, that's a bad spirit. Yeah. No, we say, you know what, you guys are, you have amazing missionary schools. You're really reaching people. We're going to be praying for you. We're praying. We, we, God revealed to us, and, and our calling is intercession, and we'll pray, but we're agreeing with you that the gospel will go forth. Mm -hmm. We'll pray for you. Pray for your missionaries. That's how it's supposed to work. Somebody says, well, we have amazing worship. Perfect. We'll pray for you that God gives you new songs. Mm -hmm. So we all work for the same kingdom. There shouldn't be any division based on, on the ministry direction that God gave. And there's many, many ministries and many different facets that they're engaging because that's assignment that God gave them. Mm -hmm. Not one church or minister or person will have everything. It, okay. God will not give you everything. He will give you. It's like a puzzle. He will give each one of you a piece. We have to fellowship together to get the full picture. Okay? So we go to one place, learn here. They come to us, learn what God gave us, whatever measure of the revelation we have. That way his children are fellowshipping together. So we have division. So we don't have it all. But some in the church will have something more than we have. We'll go there and learn from them. Sure. The other church says, hey, you have prayer here, I will go learn how to pray. Mm -hmm. And that's how God wants it to be. Mm -hmm. One big family. Mm -hmm. We're all working together, one kingdom, one diamond. All right, so he's, he's teaching the kingdom of God. All right, so let's go to, uh, he's saying, now he's saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, everything we do, Everything we say, we are calling people to repent and to believe. Okay? If there's a ministry where there's no repentance and no faith, it's a dead ministry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alright? If people are not repenting and are not believing God for miracles, 
It's a dead ministry. Amen. It's not the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is power. That's right. Is faith. Hallelujah. Is glory. So uh, when we say the kingdom of God, the implication is we are preaching repentance. You have to say you have to turn away from wickedness. You have to. You must. And you must believe uh, you know, that Jesus is who he says he is. Mm -hmm. And what he does is relevant not 2,000 years ago, but it's now. That's it's forever. Right. That's right. In this age, healing, deliverance, whatever, gifts of the Spirit. It is for us, and it's now. But we must believe and we must repent. We, you must live a life separate from the world mm -hmm. and completely turn yeah. towards God. We must mm -hmm. do that. That's, that's one of the... Um, it's not like, you know, you can kind of be in the middle and then you kind of make a decision. If, yeah. if you like it, jump in. That's mm -hmm. not the gospel. Mm -hmm. Gospel is radical. Yeah. It says, yeah. choose who you're going to serve. It's the spirit of Elijah on the mountain. Israelites are watching. There's a drought. There's a spiritual drought. There's a physical drought. And, and he says, this day you make a decision. If Baal is God, go serve him. But if Yahweh is God, serve him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the gospel. <laughs> there's, there's no alternative. There's no middle ground. Yeah. It's like, it's like you know, um, the disciples. Jesus says, if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, do you guys want to leave too? And I was talking about his body and his, and his blood and, and communion, and, and pe people were offended at the things he was saying, and Jesus does that, he offends the mind to reveal what's in the heart, right? Hallelujah. so he does that, and, and people are, and so he turns to his disciples, and he says, do you want to leave too, and Peter's like, what's the other alternative, <laughs> where could we go, I mean, there's no other way, you have the words of eternal life, where are we going to go? We have no other option but Jesus, okay? There's no option number two for anybody. Mm -hmm, yeah. So we preach the gospel with boldness, yeah. with faith, and with the anointing and the help of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's how we preach the gospel. We are not afraid to say what Jesus said mm -hmm. and to do what Jesus did. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to stop here. Um, before we go to verse 16, we'll, we'll pick up next week. Um, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to close. I'm, I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to seal this word in your heart. So it goes deep into your hearts by the heart of the Holy Spirit. So I'll pray. Father, I just ask that you seal this word in their hearts. That the word of God would run swiftly into their hearts, God. That it would touch the deep things of their heart. That it would convict. That it would uproot everything demonic, God. That it would just bring forth life that it would go into the vision of, of uh, spirit and soul, into the deep things of the heart, and seal it, Holy Spirit, with your anointing and power. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministry. I thank you for what you do. I love what you do, Holy Spirit. I thank you, you're a beautiful gift from the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done on the cross for us, God, for shedding of your blood, for the remission of sins. I thank you, Jesus. I love you, and we bless your name. Amen. Amen.